check, check one. A little hot, check one. Of course, I'm standing in front. Check one, check two. Check, check one, check two. Check one, check two. All right, and welcome everybody here to Kirkland Assembly of God. We are excited and delighted that you're here with us in person, this massive crowd that we have, and we also want to uh, welcome those who are tuning in online, and, and we're excited that you're uh, logging in with us as well. If you wouldn't mind, take a, a few moments, let us know that you are watching. Would you wouldn't mind, comment in the uh, comment section below. And just say hello and let us know that you're watching. And, and uh, also, if you want to go a further step, you could go to our website at kagchurch.com. And uh, there is a place for a connect card, uh, just some information for you to fill out. Let us know that you're uh, watching. And if you want proper follow-up, we could help uh, follow up with you. And, uh, and so we thank you for uh, tuning in today. And uh, for those that are here, also, if you wouldn't mind, take the, the moment to share this and uh, let's spread the message of hope of Christ found through this dark world that we're living in. And so anyway, so but hey, we welcome everybody today uh, to our uh, church and we just pray God's blessing upon you. Hopefully uh, you have uh, uh, enjoyed the nice weather that we've had this past week. Of course, that's sarcastically speaking. Uh, hopefully this week we'll have a little bit of warmer temperatures and uh, some of the snow will begin to melt, and, and I guess we'll have to prepare for the flood and the mud that's going to come as a result of that. Uh, but uh, how many of you are ready for some warmer temperatures to come? And hopefully uh, springtime will be around the corner, and uh, we'll uh, bypass this winter season. But uh, we're thankful for the beautiful snow and time together. Uh, anyways, and so we just pray today the Lord will bless you in a great way. Just a couple of announcements before we get in, just uh, singing a, a couple of songs this morning and sharing a, a word. Um, we have uh, this Tuesday, we'll have prayer at uh, the church at 6.30 in the evening, uh, 6.30 to 7.30. I encourage you to be a part of that. Also, we have our Wednesday night Bible study. Our Wednesday night Bible study is at our home and uh, we're going over the book of Revelations and uh, looking at what uh, the Lord has revealed to us concerning the end times and uh, what's happening during the tribulation period. And so uh, we'll be doing that at uh, 6.30 on Wednesday, and so I encourage you to be a part of that as well. Maybe weather permitting, uh, we might be at uh, courtside uh, sharing the, the gospel publicly, praying for people uh, on Fridays at... Uh, 9 o'clock to about 11.30, stand publicly at the courthouse and, and being a witness for Jesus and, sh and praying with people. And so we'll be maybe doing that this week. We'll see how 
uh, the temperature goes this week. Uh, usually about 32 degrees. We don't participate in it, but 32 is kind of our, our, our go-to. So we'll see if we're going to be there this Friday, but that could be something that we do as well. Amen. Well, we are uh, glad that you're with us today. Why don't we open up in prayer and, and just invite the presence of God as we share a time together of worship and then also a, a word together. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your blessing in our lives. Lord, we uh, just spend some time in thought and, and worship of you. And uh, Lord, we uh, pray today that as we've been studying in Revelations, God, about the heavenly host, the elders, the 24 elders and the four living creatures uh, that are gathered around the throne, laying their crowns around the feet, uh, falling on their face before you, singing, worthy are you, worthy are you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for uh, help us this morning, God, that we would have a vision of the heavenly throne, Lord, that even though we may not see it, we can by faith know that it's there. And Lord, give us, help us, Father, to join in with the, the chorus of angels that are the mighty many angels, God, that are singing, worthy is the Lamb to receive praise and honor and glory. Father, may there be a incense from this morning's worship rise to you. And may it be something that's pleasing to you, Lord, that we as your children worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, bless the time that we have together. Uh, may it be somewhat, uh, may it be fruitful. And Lord, when we leave the church house, let us say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is nice to see you all this morning, to be in person. It's always nice to be in person. So Harvey and I were joking and we thought, we haven't played in three weeks. We don't even know if we're going to know how. So, but Jeremy said it's like riding a bike. So let's sing this one. searched the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty prayers and treasures of faith never till you came along put me back together and every desire now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, are you seen them all, and you still call me free, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it again. Oh, there's nothing. Than you all, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You 
you turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can sing that again. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves. You turn graves into garbage. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can sing it again. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only you're the only, you're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, Lord, there's nothing better, better than you. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, we're grateful this morning. Father, there is nothing better than you. Lord, there is nothing higher, nothing greater, nothing better than you this morning. You deserve all of our praise, all of our glory. Father, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all in this place this morning. God, in my heart this morning, whatever I might be going through, whatever I might be walking through, whatever I might be stepping into, Father, you're worthy of it all. Father, heartbreak joy, pain, suffering. You are worthy of it all. God, we give you praise. We give you glory. We thank you for your presence. We pray that your presence would settle in this place. God, I pray for my friends. I pray for my family this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister in such a sweet, wonderful way. Father, I give you praise. I glorify your holy name. I worship you in this place, God. You said we're two or more gathered. There you are. And Father, I encourage my heart this morning that there are more than two in this place. And Father, I worship you. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercies. I thank you, Lord, this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing all the saints and angels. They bow before your throne, and all the elders cast their crowns before. Oh 
Amen. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you this morning that um, you are worthy of all praise. You are the one that has redeemed us. You gave your life for us. And uh, because of that, you are worthy to receive praise and honor and glory. You have set our feet upon a solid rock, pulled us up out of the mire, and you've gave, given us a brand new start. You've given us a new life, and you've brought us into your kingdom, and you've made us a kingdom of, of priests and, and kings. And we thank you, God, that you have exalted us. And so, Father, you deserve praise and honor and glory. We pray Lord, that as the elders laid their crowns at their feet and they fell on their faces before you in, in worthy giving praise and honor and glory to you, Father, may this morning we give praise and honor and glory to you today. Lord, we lift up uh, the congregation in prayer, and Father, we pray for, um, for Ron, we pray for Carolyn and Bill uh, Bill's son, Lord, that has uh, leu uh, leukemia and an uh, infection in his kidney. And Lord, we uh, thank you that you're an ever-present help in the time of trouble. And Lord, we pray, uh, send an SOS signal to you and, and pray for Ron today. Ask that you would intervene on his behalf, that you would uh, help, him, help him, Father, give the doctors wisdom. And we just pray, Father, for your hand to be upon him. And for others in our church today that just need your touch upon their life, may you encourage them, strengthen them, may they be going through battles and struggles uh, that we know nothing about. Father, we just pray that you would help them to continue to persevere, to fight the good fight of faith, and that you would encourage them and strengthen them this morning, Lord. And we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you have your Bibles. Uh, God bless you. You guys may be reseated. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of John. And uh, thank you, Harvey. Thank you, Heidi. And John chapter 1. And we are uh, doing a oh, kind of a series out of this passage uh, entitled Greater Things. And uh, it's kind of been a theme uh, verse for us. I'm actually going to get to that verse at some point, maybe next week. And, and really kind of show us about what God, the greater things that God wants to do. Uh, but we're talking about greater faith, greater prayer, greater church, greater God. And, uh, and so God wants to do greater things in our lives. He wants to do greater things in, in your life. And, and so we've been talking about greater faith, um, having greater faith. And so uh, John chapter 1, verse number 43, John is, is our text that we're going to be looking at. And uh, if you could go ahead, um, let me ask you this. Actually, if you, have, if you actually have an outline back there on the back, sh back uh, table, if you want to outline or jot down some notes today. And uh, the title of this message is kind of greater things, but looking for the lost, looking for the lost. And um, have you ever lost something? Um, you know, you spend your time looking trying to find it. You know, um, of course, I wrote this message about three, four weeks ago. And so about four weeks ago, uh, my wife was about to go crazy because uh, she lost a couple of things. And it was just like all of a sudden they got legs on them and walked away and could not find them. And, uh, and so one of those was a um, one of her favorite workout shirts. You know, it was just a, a cheap black uh, workout shirt that she had bought at Goodies and spent a whole whopping four dollars on. And uh, but it was one of her favorite workout shirts, and and she washed it, she folded it, she washed it, she washed it. That's how you say it here in these parts, right? She washed it, uh, she folded it. And somehow it just magically uh, disappeared. Um, and so she has looked everywhere for it and can't find it. Don't know what happened to it. And, uh, and then uh, there was another item that uh, we were cleaning the house one time and Molly was going to clean her room and, and I gave her a Nor Norwex rag to go help her have her dust her room. And uh, for whatever reason, we cannot find that Norwex rag. And you know how expensive Norwex rags are. You know, they're pretty, pretty expensive. 
And, uh, and so whatever, for whatever reason, we cannot find that black shirt and we cannot find that Norwex rag. And um, it, I started thinking about, you know, finding lost things. And a story came to my remembrance uh, when we first uh, got married, uh, when we first started in ministry, our ministry started in Oklahoma and we were youth pastors at a church and uh, we had taken, actually the young adults uh, of the church had taken a, a, a canoe trip and uh, we were floating down the river and uh, of course, you know, back then we didn't have, you know, two dimes to rub together. We didn't hard, have any money. All we had is a lot of love. That's all we had. And uh, uh, so the only valuable thing, and it wasn't very valuable, was the wedding ring that uh, we had, had purchased for her. And, um, and so this wedding ring uh, was somewhat of significance because uh, when I asked my wife to marry me, uh, back 25, 26, 20, almost 27 years ago now, um, I bought her a ring, and it was just a very cheap ring. And, you know, I just learned that, that diamonds, you know, if they have, it has a black, black speck in it, you know, it's not, it decreases the value. This had a big old black speck in it. And uh, anyways, and so we actually took this ring back uh, later on when we were in Springfield. We hadn't been married yet, but I'd bought it for her, and we took it to another place and actually bought a little bit better diamond, not very much, more expensive. And uh, uh, so she had bought this princess cut diamond ring, square cut. That's what she loved. And so she had it. It wasn't, it wasn't costly, but it was the only value that we had kind of. Uh, uh, to us, it was at that point, and so we had went on a canoe trip, and for my wife and her great wisdom that she has, uh, went canoeing with her wedding ring on, and uh, we were, you know, obviously as you're canoeing, you know, it gets hot, the sun beats on you, you put sunblock on so that, you know, you don't get burned, so she had done all that, put sunblock on, and I can remember we were floating down this point in this river where it kind of got a little fast, you know, it kind of narrowed down. You could see uh, the water was clear, and you could see, you know, maybe a couple of feet, and you could see the bottom, you could see the rocks, and, and uh, you know, so we kind of sped up, and we kind of hit a fast spot, and the boat started to tip over. You, you know what? The best marriage council uh, probably... Uh, it, you want to see if a marriage will last, put two people on a canoe uh, when you're first starting, and you'll discover if your marriage will last. And uh, anyway, so uh, I remember the boat tipped over. My wife, or it was starting to tip over. My wife leaned her hand outside of the boat to brace herself so that we wouldn't topple, and thankfully she saved our lives. And, and so we started to float down the river, and... Uh, and so as, she, as we got maybe, oh, I would guess, maybe a half mile down the river, she, <gasps> she looked at her hand and she said, we've lost my rings. And, um, and so I'm like, well, we've lost those rings. And we're like, I know when we tipped over, I stuck my hand out of the boat, and that's probably when they, when they came, when they fell off. And, and so, you know, just being a good husband, you paddle back upstream <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Kind of look at the general area where you felt like you tipped over. People are floating by. Uh, we have a couple of other families that in our church that were like, hey, we'll help you. You know, they're just doing it out of the goodness of their heart, you know. Uh, one of them told us that we just stopped because, you know, it's the nice thing to do. <laughs> we didn't expect to find anything. And so there's, I think, two or three couples that are stopped there, and we're looking for this thing and, and uh, looking for this ring. And we're all just like, eh, we ain't going to find these things. And so uh, Carl Martin, a dear friend of ours, uh, um, he, was, he, he told us, he said, we were just looking to help you, you know. Uh, but he did say, I prayed and asked the Lord to help. And so he said, I looked down and there was something shiny. He said, I thought it was a fishing lure. And as I start to look down closer, look at it, and I saw, there it was, there was your, there was your wedding ring. The cool thing of it was... Um, is the wedding rings weren't soldered together, so they were separate. And he said, you know, just a, a couple of feet over, there was your second ring right there. And, uh, and so it was just a miracle. We all thought, God, that was a miracle. Thank you. 
Uh, you know, you helped us find that thing that was valuable and precious to us. And we all just said that was a God thing, that God had to show us uh, some things there. And so I don't know about you, but have you lost something of value to you? Lost something of value to where you uh, are trying to find it? Well, that's what we're looking, talking about this morning. And, you know, that's the story of the good gospel of Jesus Christ. God has lost something that's valuable to him, and that is humanity, his creation. You are valuable to God, and you know what? Our sin separates us, and we have been, in a sense, we have been lost. And, uh, you know, so whether it's something that you've lost of importance to you, your wallet, your phone, maybe a special gift uh, from a loved one, you know, there's nothing worse than at that moment you realize you lost something that's just important to you. You know what? You check and you recheck and uh, uh, your pockets, your drawers, wh wherever, and you're hoping and praying that whatever it is lost somehow will magically reappear. And uh, you know what? God has lost something that's important. The Bible tells us this, that he describes every person who does not know Jesus Christ as being lost, whether they know it or not. They are lost and headed to destruction, and what needs to happen is they need to be found by God and brought back home. Now, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells us that God is looking for lost things. Uh, he tells some parables there, three parables. One is the parable of the lost sheep, one is the parable of the lost coin, and one is the parable of the lost son. These are things that were valuable to him. The parable of the lost sheep is when the, the, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go get the one. And uh, I, don't, I heard, you know what, you would think he would leave the 99 to go find the one that's wandering, to go find the one that's lost. And uh, you know what, we were thankful, you know what, uh, that, uh, you, you know, you appreciate the shepherd come finding you when you're the one that's lost, right? And you're the one that's uh, not found. And, 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 and so anyways, that's the parable of the lost sheep. And then we have the parable of the lost coin, which is something that's of value to where the, uh, they, they lost this value, this coin, and they do everything that they can to sweep, to look, to find this coin. And when they find the sheep and when they find the coin, there is such rejoicing, uh, there is such appreciation that, that, in fact, the Bible even says that the angels in heaven are rejoicing when one lost sheep is found. And obviously we hear the story of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son that comes home and the joy that happens. And so God is in the business of finding lost things. That's what he wants, to find lost things. Now, in John chapter 1, how I many you know we're still looking for that black shirt and that uh, Norwex rag? I don't know. We may have given up hope on it, uh, but uh, anyway, so... Uh, but God is still pursuing and looking for lost things. In John chapter 1, verse number 43 through 45, uh, is the story really of Nathaniel being found. Nathaniel being found, Philip being found, and Nathaniel being found. They were lost, but now they are found. And how, how, do, how did they come about being found? And so let's look at this verse here in John chapter 1, verse number 43. It says, uh, if you could clear that out, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip, what did he do? Found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, we see this, we see Philip found Nathanael. You know, Jesus found something that was lost, and it was a lost son, a Philip. And, and Philip had a transformation experience because as Jesus found Philip, it says then Philip received this call to follow Christ, and then also he started to find other people. Do you see that? Philip was found by Jesus, but then, then Philip started finding other people. And you know what? That's our responsibility. When we come to faith in Christ, our job is to help find lost people. 
And uh, that's what Philip starts doing. He starts finding other people for Christ. And it says Philip found Nathaniel. Now, however long ago it was, maybe four weeks ago, I challenged us in this first part of looking for the loss uh, of, of finding your Nathaniel. Who is the Nathaniel in your life that you were supposed to find? And, um, and so, anyways, and so the, the challenge for us as believers is to find somebody, uh, is to find who is the Nathaniel in our life that we are to find. And so, um, I've, I've, in this message here, looking for the lost, uh, having people come to faith in Christ, uh, I'll share with you kind of five looks uh, for the lost, finding lost people. And who is your Nathaniel? We talked about uh, uh, at the, the first point here in the five looks for the lost. The first look is this, is that we need to look around. Look around. Do you see that up there, Owen? Is it there? Look around. Look around. In other for us to find people, we have to have eyes to see people. John 4.35, uh, Jesus said this to the disciples. Uh, if you could clear that out, yeah. Do, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. You know, so the idea here is, is we need to identify people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We need to look around. And this is Jesus telling the disciples, saying, hey guys, you're missing harvest you're not looking around at the people, open up your eyes. This is not a delayed harvest where it's three or four months down the road. It's ripe right now. Look around. He's telling us as the church that we need to open up our eyes and look around at the people around us. And I would, I would guess that would be us too. Really, we need to be seeing people, looking to try to find people. We need to be, have kind of a hit list, I guess, if you would call that. We need to identify who we're trying to reach for Christ, looking around, because we can miss the opportunity. We can ha not have harvest eyes, put on our harvest glasses, and we can miss seeing people. Now, uh, in, in this, who, who are we trying to find? And, and so this passage in John 1 kind of gives us four areas of who we need to find. The first one is this, we need to find family. Find family. Luke chapter 1 verse number 40, 42 says this, one of the two heard John speak and followed him and was Andrew, Simon Peter's what? Brother. He first found his what? Own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. We want our families to come to Christ. The first area that we need to look at is our own family whether it be our spouse, whether it would be our children, whether it would be our parents, whether it would be our grandparents or our grandkids or kids, uh, our aunts or uncles, our own family needs to come to faith in Christ. And so it's, it's, it's pretty cool here that, you know, uh, Andrew finds Peter. Andrew, you know, you hear more about Peter more than you do Andrew, but the fact of the matter is Andrew was probably the first disciple of Jesus that started following Jesus. You don't hear much about Andrew. You hear more about Peter. He was kind of the church leader. Uh, but if it wasn't for Andrew, Peter wouldn't come to faith in Christ. I just want to encourage us, you know, it's our family. The first area that we need to look at is our family. You know what? We can't think about it would be a horrible thing that we think that our family ends up in hell. The first mission field really should be our own family. You know, as a pastor, you know, oftentimes we can overlook our own family and think of the mission field out there. But the first mission field that they teach you in Bible college is your own family. And, um, and so we want our own kids, we want our own, our own uh, you know, children to come to faith in Christ. We want to pass this faith baton on to them. And we want them uh, to have that same faith. So I want to encourage you, when you're looking for lost people, find it, look in your family. Number two, find your friends. Find your friends. In Luke chapter 1, verse number 43 through 44, it says, The following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. 
Bethsaida is, is not a big town. It's a small town, probably a fishing community. Uh, uh, and so, but we have Philip and Andrew and, si- and Peter, Simon Peter, from the same area, from the same town. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you. Uh, the second area that you need to look at is those that you have a close relationship with. Those that you uh, already have a prior relationship with, that they know you, you know them, and, uh, and so anyways, your friends. I just want to encourage you, true friends are going to tell their real friends about Jesus, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Friends are going to tell people about Jesus, and so I just want to encourage you that you would find uh, uh, friends. The third area uh, that we need to look in and finding lost people, and that is uh, find your fishing buds. And this would be people who you work with. Matthew 4, 18 through 22, uh, it's the story of, of Jesus calling, Matt, uh, calling Simon Peter and Andrew and also James and John. And uh, go ahead to that passage. He walks by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, called them, and cast their nets on the sea, and they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me, I will make you a fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Out of the disciples, out of the 12 disciples, it's probably said that at least four, maybe seven of them were fishermen. And uh, we see here that Simon Andrew, Simon Peter and Andrew, and then, then Philip. Philip may have been a fisherman, not for sure. But, uh, but and so do you see this, that... Those who you work with, those who you do business with, those, that's your mission field. That's your mission field. God has called you there uh, at that workplace to reach people for Christ, to find them for Him. And so I just want to encourage you that you would begin to think that your mission field is where you work. But not only where you work, how about also with where you play? Where there's, like for us, obviously, we, we've been going to the YMCA, and I've got a new set of people that I've been in contact with. Guess what? Those who I not only work with, <laughs> those who I, I work with, but the YMC, the, these people are, these new people are, are the mission field that the Lord has called me to. Not only that, but also you think about the bus, you think about the school, you think about the kids that, that are involved with it. Those are the mission field that God has called us to work. We, we can't just begin to see them as people. we got to begin to open up our eyes and see them as our mission field, those that we work with. The fourth area we need to look in, and that is in the area was you need to find foes. Luke chapter 1, verse 46 says this, And Nathanael said to him, well, we found the Messiah. What did Nathanael say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Obviously, there was a bit of rivalry between uh, Nazareth and Bethsaida. Um, And so there was kind of natural enemies uh, toward that. And and so, you know, I just want to encourage us that, uh, you know, we don't even want our worst enemies to go to hell. I mean, yes, you know, we want them to have judgment. <laughs> yes, we want them to have punishment. Uh, but, you know, in fact, that's why uh, Jonah wouldn't even go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because God, uh, Jonah knew that God would be graceful to forgive the Ninevites. The Ninevites did terrible things to the Israelites. And Jonah didn't want them to have grace Jonah wanted them to have punishment. And, uh, and so attitudes like that will stop people from going to hell. If we have ra- racial prejudice in our hearts towards people, it will stop people from going to hell because we won't reach out to them. You know, obviously Jesus ministered to the Samaritan woman, right? She was, uh, well, let's, let's, first of all, she was a woman. She was a Samaritan. She was of a different race. Uh, she was also kind of, um, uh, she lived a sinful lifestyle. She had five, she had been divorced five times, and she was currently living in adultery with another man. So there were some things that could have very easily stopped Jesus. In fact, that's probably what stopped the disciples as they went into town to get food, to minister to this woman, to have harvest eyes to see her, because they probably had some, she's a woman, she's a, uh, a woman kind of of the night, 
She's, uh, a, she's a Samaritan. She's a mixed breed. Uh, you know what? She has a sinful lifestyle. We're going to avoid that person, right? That's a natural enemy. We're going to avoid that. But guess what Jesus did? Jesus ministered to her, and guess what happened? She got saved. Not only did she get saved, but what happened is she went to the town, the community, and there was a great revival. Jesus ministered there in Samaria, and many people came to faith, all because Jesus was willing to minister to his foes. Now, you know what? I would want to encourage us. You know, even the Apostle Paul uh, didn't start out as a good fella. In fact, he was a persecutor of Christianity. He, he killed Christians, and he wanted to, to stamp out Christianity, and he wanted to kill people. But what happened to him? How many know people that are antagonistic against Christianity can get saved? They can come to know the Lord. Paul was an example of that. And, uh, you know, and so I just want to encourage you, your foes can get saved. They can have a Damascus Road experience. They can bring change. God, God can change their heart. God transformed uh, a Saul, uh, a Saul's heart, and he became the Apostle Paul, right? And so I just want to encourage you, for those who you think may be your natural enemies, I want you to begin to see them as opportunities that God could radically transform their lives and they could come to faith in Christ. So having harvest eyes, looking for the lost. Jesus said, look around, for the harvest is great. Look in some areas. First, look in your family. Secondly, look in your friends. Thirdly, look for your, uh, your fishing buddies, those who you work with or those who you play with. And then fourthly, look at your foes. Look at the natural enemies that God may be asking you to reach into. So we need to start looking around. Look around. The second thing that I want us to do here, uh, the five looking for the lost. And the second thing is this. And if you, if, you would, if you would actually back at this handout sheet, there are name four people from each category. So who would be somebody that's from your family that needs to be that needs to come to know the Lord? Who is somebody that is a friend that needs to come to know the Lord? Who is somebody that is uh, uh, that you work with or play with that needs to come to know the Lord? And then fourthly, who is the person that's your foe? Identify that person. Now, let's, let's go to uh, number two in looking for the lost because the next step is not just having to look around, but we also need to look up. Look up. What do you mean? By this, I mean we need to start praying for them. Those that we identify, we need to identify. This is kind of the, if you would, the hit list. <laughs> These are the people that are the targets. These are the ones that we are saying, this is the target, Lord. Would you begin to work in their lives? But then secondly, we need to have a hit list, but then we need to have a prayer list. I need to start praying for them, praying for these people. The second thing is to look up. Romans 10, verse number 1, uh, Paul said this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That's powerful. Short little phrase that the Apostle Paul his desire for Israel was not freedom. His desire for Israel was not growth. His desire for Israel was not to be blessed. His desire for Israel was not prosperity. But what was his desire for Israel? That they would be saved. They would be found. That they would know the Lord. And, you know, that's... You know, is that our desire? You know, so Paul's wish for them was that they would be saved. And, and you know, it's really our desire, our duty uh, is for the desire of salvation for our own, for our family, for our friends, for our fishing buds, and for our foes. So as we look around and identify those who we desire for them to be found... Now we look up and we pray for them to be found. We look up with our list and we pray for those who are unsaved to be saved. 
You know, Charles Spurgeon said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for in this life. Wow. Are we praying for those who are not saved? Now, Paul's concern for Israel's salvation involved two things. If you look at this, uh, go to the next slide. There are two things. If you have your Bible, circle these words. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they be saved. Uh, These two words are really important for us to look up and for people to being saved. Now, two questions that we need to ask ourselves based upon this verse here. Number one is this, is do I have a burden for the lost? Do I have a burden for the lost? Notice what Paul said. He said, my heart's desire. Do you see that? My heart's desire. What is my heart's desire? Is that they may be saved. So, do I have a burden for the lost? Like Paul, is my desire for Israel to be saved? Is it my pleasure? Is it my burden? Is it what I desire? Do I have a desire for people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me ask you this. What is your heart's desire? Where is our burden for the lost? Where is it? Dallas Morning News on June 11, this is back in 1994, said 68% of professing Christians outside of the Bible Belt don't see evangelism as being the number one priority of the church. But the Barna Research Group found that among American adults who said that they were born again, 75% couldn't even define the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? A survey by Christianity Today, a major evangelical magazine, found that only 1% of their readership said that they had witnessed to someone recently. That means that 99% of their readership was just lukewarm when it came to the concern of the fate of the ungodly. And according to Zondervan Church Source, 97% of the church has no involvement in any sort of evangelism. That's sad news, isn't it? You know what? What happened to the burden of the church for people to get saved and come to know the Lord? Where is that desire? Are we weeping for the lost? Are we praying for the lost? Do we have a heart for evangelism for them? D.L. Moody uh, told the story of his own conversion in this way. He said, when I was in Boston and I used to attend a Sunday school class, and one day I recollect my teacher came around behind the counter of the shop I was at work in, put his hand upon my shoulder, and talked to me about Christ and my soul. I had not felt that I had a soul till then. I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here is a man who never saw me till lately, and he is weeping over my sins, and I never shed a tear about them. But I understand it now and know what it is to have a passion for men's souls and to weep over their sins. I don't remember that what he said, but I can still feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder tonight. Wow. Thank God for that man that had a heart for souls. Infected, impacted, influenced D.L. Moody. But where is our passion? Where is our heart and our fervency? Our burden for the lost. The Bible tells us this. is Where is our desire? In Psalms 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. You know what? This is probably one of the most quote, misquoted verses in the Bible. It's basically people read that and say, God will give me what I wish. Right? <laughs> God will give me what I desire. The Bible says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and then He will give you the desires of your heart. The reason why we don't have desires for the lost is because we're not delighting ourselves in the Lord. 
God will place those desires within us. How many know those are desires that he wants to answer, right? God's desires placed within us that if I delight myself, enjoy being in his presence, spend time in his word, spend time in prayer, then what can happen is he will put desires within me that are evangelistic. He'll put his desires within us. Now, in John 15, 7 is another passage. It's the, the parable of the vine and the branch about staying in the vine. John 15, 7, I think this is another misquoted verse. It says, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you, de- what you desire. You ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, do you see that? If you abide in me, my words abide in you. That's the, the parable of the, the vine and the branch. Staying, if the branch stays in the vine, God is the vine. If I stay connected to him, the sap flow of, of the Holy Spirit will flow through me, then I'll bear fruit. But if I'm disconnected from him, then I will, then I will actually shrivel up and, and die. But if I stay connected, what happens is his desires are put within sight of me. Now he says, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. How many of you know God, if God's desires are within you, God wants to answer those desires 100%. But most people think, well, he wants to give me what I desire, what I want. If my desires are in alignment with his desires, then 100% 100% he will answer those, he'll answer those prayers. There has to be an alignment with his will and my will. He will give me those desires, and then I pray those desires. Okay? So I would just encourage us that are we praying for the lost? Where is our heart's desire for people uh, to be birthed, to be saved? Paul said, My heart's desire is that Israel would be saved. But not only, here's the second part of that question is this, is am I praying for the lost? Paul said this, not only is what's my heart's desire for for them, but am I praying to them, praying to God? What am I praying to God is that they would be saved, that Israel would be saved. And so... Prayer is just offering up our desire to God. That is what prayer is. And we pray about what our heart's desire is. And if you have a, have a heart's desire before you, you lift it to God. And so are we praying, obviously, for the salvation of people? Now, if we... If we, it takes both of these. Notice this. If you don't have a desire, you're not going to pray, right? If we don't have a heart's desire, then we won't pray. So it's, it's going to take both of those. But if I have a desire but don't pray, then all I have is a desire, right? If I, if I don't have a desire, most likely, then I won't be praying, right? So The problem, it takes both of those. I have to have a heart's desire, and then I have to pray to God uh, for that. And so, do I have a heart to pray for the lost? Do I have a heart to lift them up in prayer, like Jesus did on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them? Do I have the passion that inspired John Knox to plead, give me Scotland or I die? Is your attitude that of George Whitfield, who prayed, Oh Lord, give me souls or take my soul? Do you, like Henry Martin, mourn when you see others trapped in false religion and cry out, I cannot endure existence if Jesus is, not, is to be so dishonored? When you have a clear and vivid understanding of what is at stake in the gospel, it's an issue of life or death and eternity in heaven or hell, Do you realize that your unbelieving family members, friends, and co-workers, and neighbors will spend forever suffering and torment away from the presence of God if they do not embrace Christ? That realization should drive us to our knees to plead not only with them to believe the gospel, but with God to save their souls. 
The 17th century English Puritan Richard Baxter wrote, Oh, if you have the hearts of Christians or of men in you, let them yearn outwards, your poor, ignorant, ungodly neighbors. Alas, there is but a steep betwixt them and death and hell. Many hundred diseases are waiting, ready to seize on them, and if they die unregenerate, they are lost forever. Have you, have your, your heart, have you hearts of rock? That cannot pity men in such a case as this. If you believe not the word of God and the dangers of sinners, why are you Christians yourselves? If you do believe it, why do you not bestir yourself to helping of others? Now, so what should I pray for, Pastor? We've identified these families, these friends, these fishing buddies, and these foes. And I... And I see that I need to be having a desire for them and to pray for them. So what do I pray for them? Let me encourage you to pray Acts 26, verse number 18 over them. This is Paul's salvation and transformation uh, experience uh, and his divine commission that he received from the Lord. This verse is a classic statement of what the Lord Jesus desires from the preaching of the gospel to the lost. In Acts 26, verse 18, it says to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. A lot to say there, but let me just boil it down to four things to pray for those uh, that, who are lost. Number one is this, I need to pray for revelation. The scripture says to open up their eyes. You see, the world and Satan has blinded people from the reality of the truth found in Jesus Christ. You know what? God is in the business of opening blinded eyes. You know, I once was blind, but now I see. I have a revelation of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you have a knowledge of that, thank God that your eyes are open to the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we need to pray that eyes would be open. We need to pray for revelation. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4. Do I have that Owen up there? It's been four weeks ago that I put this up there, so I can't, I don't know. If I may not, okay. Revelation or 2 Corinthians 4 4 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, there is a veiling of the gospel. There comes a point in time when people, even sometimes they hear a gospel message, but they their their eyes are veiled. There's there's a un, lack of understanding that happens. And, and Paul is saying, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You know what? Only preaching Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit will open their understanding. So when you're praying for those that are on your hit list, the prayer list, then you need to be praying, God, open their minds open their hearts that they may have understanding and revelation of the gospel the good news of of jesus christ the second thing you need to pray for is in this passage acts 26 verse 18 is to pray for repentance said open up their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light that's my uh name isn't it turn Turner, uh, I did a, some study on that. Part of uh, there's such profoundness in my name. One of those is that my name could be like a pancake Turner. You know, you flip it over. How exciting is that? But you know what? That's what turning is. Repentance. It means that you know what you're headed this direction. You turn it around. You turn things around. You you were heading in a life of sin. You were heading in a life of darkness. Instead of going in this direction, things get turned around, and now you start following Christ, right? In order to turn them from what? Darkness to light, the power of Satan to God. 
You know, and so I just want to encourage you that two things he says that they need to be turned from. Darkness, how many people are living in darkness? People are living in that darkness, that depression, that hole. They're living in that darkness and they need to experience the light of Jesus. They, they, they need to turn from the power of Satan to God. There's, it's one of two options, isn't it? There is no middle ground. You are either living for God or you're living for the devil. There is no option. There is no, and if you're not receiving Christ, even though you're a good person, you're still living for the devil. That's the truth. And so I just want to encourage you, part of what you need to be praying for is that they would repent, that they would turn from that life of sin. That they would turn from that. Repentance. Number three, we need to pray for reception. Paul said this, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance. Pray that they will receive two things. What is that? Two things that they will receive. One is forgiveness of sins. Oh, you know, there's only one who can forgive sins, and that's God. God is the only authority who can cancel out and forgive sins. And so we need to say, God, that they would, that they would receive the forgiveness of sin. John the Baptist he declared, he said, John, here's the one, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God, the sacrificial one who died and took our place. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and, uh, and so, that not only a forgiveness of sins, but you know what? We, we forget the sins, but then we also receive an inheritance. We receive the, the promise of eternal life. We receive this inheritance of heaven. We receive this inheritance of what we receive from God. We receive this inheritance from Him. So, we pray not only uh, for them to, uh, uh, to have a revelation not only to have repentance, but then they would be a, there would be a receptiveness, and uh, and so we we pray for that today, and so then fourthly, the fourth thing that we need to pray for is we need to pray for a realization. We need to pray for a realization. In verse that, that verse twenty Acts twenty six verse eighteen said, "Among those who are sanctified by faith in me." All right, so what, what are you saying, realization? You know, most people think that when I get saved, then I start doing, I start doing good things. That I'm, a good, I'm a good person, and so this makes me right with God. You know, I, I am sanctified by God by me doing good things. That's, that is not biblical at all. I know it sounds like it's, you know what, God rewards good behavior. You know what, but the fact of the matter is, is, where do we draw the line on goodness? Where is the line of goodness at? Right? Where's goodness? To determine if a person makes it to heaven, he's a good person. Okay, he, was a good, he did good things. He, you know what? He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He didn't cheat. He didn't do this. Right? Uh, so goodness. That's what this gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. It's not about us being good. It's about us obtaining righteousness that's by faith in Christ. We obtain righteousness by faith. And he's saying, among those who are sanctified, how am I sanctified? By faith in me. How am I sanctified? Okay, well, let's talk about, I mean, the, 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 the rich young ruler was pretty good, wasn't he? I mean, he even said, of the Ten Commandments, I haven't cheated, I haven't cut, I haven't done this, I haven't done this. But what, what was the issue he had? He had possessions in his life. He had uh, money. Not that money is necessarily a sinful thing, but if it takes the place of God, it can become a God in your life. And he was unwillingly to, to get it. Well, let's talk about goodness then. If, 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 if I am going to be good and I'm going to make it to heaven, then I have to obey all of the law. I have to obey every single law that there is. And folks, has anybody obeyed every single law that there is? Absolutely not. Well, let's just put ourselves in light of the Ten Commandments. Well, let's think about this, okay? Have I ever, uh, the Bible says, have I, have I ever, have I ever, thou shalt not, thou shalt not uh, bear false witness. Have I, have I ever lied before? Has anybody ever lied before? 
whether it be a small white lie or a big lie. Have I lied? What is that person called then, Owen? A liar. They're called a liar. The Bible tells us that all liars have their place in the lake of fire. Uh, okay, so the Bible says that we shall, not, we shall not steal. Have I ever stolen anything from somebody? A piece of candy? I remember stealing something from the store when I was a young boy. Uh, stealing, have, has, have you ever stolen something? Whether it be a church pen that's sitting here at the church, right? Have you ever stolen something, Owen? What would that person be called if they did steal something? They would be a thief. All right. The next thing would be, well, let's just in the light of the Ten Commandments. Have I ever, uh, the Bible says about committing adultery, Jesus said, if you look lustfully at a woman, have you ever committed adultery? Jesus said, if you look lustfully, you've committed adultery. You've committed the act in your mind and your heart. So have you ever looked at somebody and lusted some, at somebody? Well, what would that consider you? An adulterer. So by our own admission, we say that, you know what, hey, I have, I'm a liar, I am a thief, and I've committed adultery. Has anybody ever blasphemed the name of the Lord before? Just flippantly used God's name in vain? Has anybody ever said, oh, whatever it is? Right, so if we stand before God on Judgment Day, and we have lied, we have stilled, we have committed adultery, and we have blasphemed against the name of God, what is a holy God going to do for us on that day? What would, a, what would a judge do? Right, You would be guilty. But here's the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that we are not made right with God by our good works. We are made right with God by our faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He There's a great exchange. What is that exchange? That exchange is we give him our sin and he gives us his righteousness. And so that's what happens. And all that transpires by faith in his son. What did he say? I pray among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. That if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. He says, for with the mouth, confession is, righteousness is made, for with the mouth, how does it say, mouth, righteousness is made unto salvation. In other words, by faith, by faith, how did Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's, that's the realization. And most people think that, you know what, I get sanctified by me doing right, by me doing those things. Yeah, you know what, you are going, it hopefully will bring transformation to your life because you repent of those sins. You don't do those things anymore. But sanctification, righteousness is obtained by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me put a period here at this sermon I just want to encourage you, remind us that we are praying for the lost. How do, we, how do we look up? We need to look around, we see, but then we also look up. We begin to pray. And we pray, uh, first of all, prayer comes when we have a desire to pray. And then we want to pray to God. And then, what do we pray about? Well, we pray about that their eyes, that they would have revelation, their eyes would be open. We pray that... Uh, uh, for repentance, that they would turn from the darkness of, and to the light, from Satan to God. We pray for reception, that they would receive forgiveness of sins and that they would know the inheritance that they have and that, that we, we pray for uh, re re realization, that they are realized that they are sanctified by faith in Jesus. But I also want to point out here two things real quickly, and we're finished. Heidi, you can go ahead and come back. I want to point out two additional thoughts here on Romans 10, verse 1. And the first one is this, and that is the need for us to continue to pray for the salvation of Israel. Oh, okay. You don't have to come back up here, babe. Israel, our, key, our keyboard is not working. Okay. 
realize this, we need the, the need to pray for the salvation of Israel. Now keep, keep this in mind. Paul had a desire for his nation and his country. Yeah, I don't know about you, but particularly in the days and the times that we're living in, America needs to support the nation of Israel. Israel is the seatbed of end-time events. Israel is the place where Christ is going to set up his kingdom. Israel is the nation that God revealed himself through, whom Jesus came through, the Jewish people. And I want you to notice here that Paul um, is so concerned about the nation of Israel. And, And you think about it, Israel's rejection of the Messiah... Israel missed, not all of Israel, missed the visitation of God coming to them through Jesus. The religious system missed it. Notice that God didn't go. You you would think that if God was going to do something religious, he would go to the religious system of Israel's time. But how many know the, the religious system of of that time of G- during Jesus' birth was so uh, apostate, was so away from God, that God bypassed them and came in and found some young woman and young boy, found some lowly shepherds, found some wise men. God came, and, and by and large, Israel missed the day of visitation that God came to them. Now, there are some Israel, there are some Jew, Messianic Jews, those who are Jewish that believe in Jesus. But if you go talk to a lot of Jewish people, there are people that are still waiting for the Messiah to come. And so Israel, in a sense, rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And, and as, as Israel rejected, it caused the Gentiles those who were non-Jewish people, to receive Jesus Christ. It caused other people, and Jesus really became a rock of offense, a stone of stumbling to unbelieving Israel, which grieved the Apostle Paul, who longed that his fellow countrymen would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And so, he has a concern for it. And what are you saying? I'm saying... You know what, and and particularly as we kind of look at the last days, we're kind of going to be doing a series called The End Is Here. And during the last days, there's going to be there's going to be people that will turn, particularly Jewish the Israel, Israel, there are going to be people that will return and discover that Jesus is the Messiah. The blinder, the stumbling block has been removed, and they're going to realize that he is the Messiah. And there's going to be people that will come back, Jewish people that will come back. What are you saying? I'm just saying this. You know what? Let's not forget to pray for the nation of Israel. Let's not forget to pray for the... We're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's the place where Christ is going to set up his kingdom. There's a battlefield right there. That's the heart of it. There are, what, three or four different religions that are fighting for that, that small territory that everybody's trying to wipe out. It's significant, very significant. So, like Paul, let's not forget to pray for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. But then secondly, let's have the need to pray for the salvation of America. Let's, like Paul, have a desire for the nation, the country that we live in to be saved. Boy, we need it, don't we? America needs God. And so we need to be praying for the United States of America. That's our desire. That's our duty is to pray for our nation. You know what? We love America. And we want America to be saved. We want them to be, we want them, America to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, and that many will believe on him. Let's let that be our pleasure for our heart and our spiritual burden for America to be saved.
Father, we thank you this morning that you're in the business of finding lost things. We thank you, Lord, that the, the old anthem song that says, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Lord, we were apart from you. But Lord, I thank you that you left the 99 to come find us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have a desire to help find the lost like Philip found Nathaniel. Lord, I pray that you would help us to look around us to be able to see our family, our friends, our co-workers, our fishing buddies, even our enemies. That God, that we would see them as being lost. And Father, not only would we look around, but we would also look up. That God, we would, with our heart's desire and prayer, look up to you and pray like the Apostle Paul said, is that Israel would be saved. Father, give us a desire. Help us to have a burden for lost people. And Lord, help us to have a desire to pray for lost people. Help us to pray for our nation, the nation of Israel. Help us to pray for the United States of America. Lord, we want to pray, Father, in Acts chapter 26, verse number 18, for revelation that their eyes would be open to the gospel truth. Would the veil be removed? And when they come to understand the true meaning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Father, we also want to pray for repentance, that people would turn from sin, from darkness to light, to Satan, to God. We pray, Father, that there would be a reception, that they would receive the forgiveness of sins and receive the inheritance. We pray, Father, that there would be a realization that, God, that we are sanctified by faith in Christ. Lord, we thank you, God. I pray that you would help us to begin to look up and to begin to pray for people today. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe perhaps you're watching online or you're here in today. Are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Do you know the gospel message? You know that we sinned against God. We transgressed and broke, broken the law. Sin separated us from God. And... and all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because Christ died for us, the Bible says that if we put our faith in him and trust him for our sins and turn from our sins, repent, that we will be reconciled to God and the wrath of God will be no longer against us. If you're here today, and you don't know the gospel message that God loves you even in the midst of your sin, that you would turn from your sin, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and live for him. And your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life, and you'll have abundant life and eternal life. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to give you opportunity this morning. If that's you here today, let me lead you in prayer. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I have fallen short of your standard. I have missed the mark. I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. Help me to turn from my sins. Help me to not go my own way, but to serve and live for you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I pray that from this day forward, that I will live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you send me an email at kirklandag at gmail.com? I have some follow-up information of what to do, what's next. Now start your faith journey. What do you do from this point forward? And I want to give you some information that will help you with that today. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today. One last prayer for us today before we leave is I just want to pray that you will have a burden to pray for the lost. I want to encourage you to develop a hit list, but then also a prayer list. Start praying for people. Look for people in your family. Look for people that are friends. 
your foes and your, who you work with and ask the Lord and start praying for them. Start spending time with the Lord and getting a burden for Him that they would be saved today. I just want to encourage you to, to do that this morning as we close in prayer today. Father, I pray for those that are watching that you would help us, those that are here, to begin to have a burden for the lost. God, help us as we spend time in your presence and spend time in your word, that God, your desires would be placed with inside of us, that we would be in alignment with what you want to do, and that God, that we, like Paul, would begin to pray for those that are, are, that are on our list. Father, that they would come to be saved. Lord, we also want to pray for Israel. And Lord, we know that that's battleground and that's territory, that, Father, this, that's sacred ground. And Lord, we just pray for your protection and peace to settle over that area. And Lord, we trust, Father, that you're going to rule and reign. Lord, we also want to lift up the United States of America. Father, that our heart's desire and prayer to God is that America would be saved, that they would come to know you. Lord, and we thank you for it, Lord, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming to the house of God.